the first migrants boarded a 93-metre-long barge, the Bibby Stockholm, which is moored in Portland Port in Dorset. They are just a small fraction, though, of the total number, but that small fraction is causing significant local concern. The first residents boarded the barge before lunchtime after weeks of delays. 500 will eventually be on board, says the government. Though not by the end of this week, as one minister suggested this morning. Now, a refugee charity, Care for Calais, says lawyers have been able to block the transfer of about 20 asylum seekers so far. The Fire Brigade Union continues to maintain that the fire safety is it, it, still a, a strong risk. Cramming so many people on board um, perhaps it raises the risk of transmission of disease. Uh, added to which, many of those who go on board may already have been held in detention facilities and there's, therefore there's the risk of re-traumatisation. Similarly, this is now effectively a boat on water and some will all already have been traumatised by their crossings potentially of the Mediterranean and certainly across the Channel. Well, it's not only rights groups who have voiced opposition to housing asylum seekers on the Bibby Stockholm. The plan has also been met with concern from members of the local community. And it's not just in Portland, where the vessel is docked, that is the case. The Bibby Stockholm is one of a number of alternative sites that the Home Office is using to end reliance on expensive hotels for asylum seekers. So, joining us now to talk through this is Dr Susan Phoenix, who's a resident of Portland and a member of No to the Barge. From RAF Scampton, Sarah Carter, lead campaigner of Save Our Scampton, and Dan Gascoigne, chief executive of Braintree Council in Essex. Good evening to all three of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Susan, if we could start with you. Obviously, you're in Portland. We've been talking about the Bibby Stockholm. 15 people boarded today. What's your reaction? What are your thoughts about having this barge in Portland Port? Well, I'm surprised so many uh, boarded today, having seen the safety problems that have been declared now at long last. Our thoughts are that it really is just a sticking plaster, isn't it? It's just the government's vanity project to try and get it sorted out, um, preferably before Rishi Sunak comes back from his holidays, I feel. It isn't going to work. It's going to be more expensive than the hotels because the guys are not going to agree to go on by the look of it. And looking at that now that you have on your screen, you can see it's a dangerous piece of kit to be in. The fact that these men may be speaking all kinds of different languages, depends who's going to be doing the, the safety work with them. It's just the wrong place for them. Plus, our island is an island and we have one tiny road on and off that one accident fouls up. So if we need it at any time, fire engines, ambulances, all of that, it's just not going to work. Uh, so it, it, it's a disaster. I don't know who made this decision, but we certainly shouldn't have had it made for here. Specifically, what safety problems? Because Robert Jenrick said it's absolutely safe. Well, he would, wouldn't he? But the, um, the fire brigade it union... Is or is it, it, it either is or it isn't. Well, so exactly. I'm wondering what safety concerns um, you have. Well, the fact that there are only two exits from a building that size, the fact that the fire brigade union themselves have said, well, we just have to wait and see now, they're not happy with it. And also the fact we have a letter here from the group manager, the Dorset and Wiltshire Fire and Rescue Service saying, well, we're not really taking the responsibility. We're putting it over to the CTM, which is the Australian company, and Landry and King, the American company, who are the vessel operator. Now, I'm a bit concerned about all this slopey shoulder business. Who is going to look after these guys and our island if something goes wrong? Just to um, answer that, Cheryl Avery, the rec Director of Asylum Accom Accommodation, has said that security and safety is of paramount importance and that they're working closely with Dorset Fire and Rescue and the local authority. When you say when this all goes wrong, what exactly do you mean by that? For example, if there is a fire on board, if something disastrous like that happens, if they have a massive fight on board, and these guys I know, uh, I've worked with many uh, groups of various different cultures around the world, and we know that if they're not all happy together, there will be conflict, and we may need the police in a rush. We don't have enough policemen. We don't have uh, an ambulance service that can come very easily. So we're anticipating for the worst and hoping for the best. I think that's what we can say. Do you, do you think that is a useful narrative? Saying that, oh, if they all have a fight, they're all from different cultures, they all don't speak the same language. There's 15 people on board there. Do you think 
that you're portraying them accurately? No, I don't, because at the moment, no one knows. We have had nothing but lies and obfuscation from the beginning. Uh, nobody consulted the local people. Uh, and to this day, we haven't had a consultation. The local councils didn't. Uh, in fact, it came down from the Home Office, just with, I, I call it, bullying from the Home Office, then to the local Port Authority, who are still refusing to speak to local people to allay their fears. So, of course, uh, all of this whatever it's called, the whispering, the Chinese whispering will go on. And it's unsettling this very small island with 13 and a half thousand people on it. They're, they're just not happy, let's put it that way. And the fact it's causing social division, because of course various groups are coming in from outside, it's, it's a mess. I can't think of a better it's, word, but it's a mess. Yeah, look, there's 15 people though, Susan. Uh, 15 at the moment, yes, <laughs> that's okay, thank goodness. Uh, and where I think this is a case of suck it and see, you know, let's get them on slowly. That's OK for now. And hopefully they've brought the, the people that do speak English, that can speak to each other, that are good people. But, you know, you've worked with groups of people out of 500. We have to hope that most of them will be well behaved and good and know the rules. But look at those corridors you're looking at now on screen. They're tiny. Um, I heard uh, Sorry one of the to local jump in. I, 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 this categorization of good people and, and bad people, I would assume, is there anything to make you suggest that the people who are coming onto this barge are not good people, as you would say? Uh, life. You know, I have lived three quarters of a century and I have worked with all kinds of groups of people, even were they 500 yeah, British I'm soldiers. Assuming... I would still concern that some people are likely to have a little fight. OK. I want to pick up on what you said about councils and bring in Dan Gascoigne. Um, Dan, you are from... Let me get this correct. Um, you are from... Sorry about that. Braintree Council. You're the chief executive there. And you have objected to the use of Weatherfield as a site to house asylum seekers. You have been successful in that, haven't you, thus far. Can you tell us your experience? Well, we... Um as a district council welcome asylum seekers who want to uh, go through their asylum journey and get processed and, and integrated into the community. Our concern with Weathersfield all along has been that it's a very isolated site with limited local services. Uh, it's a very rural area. The site's 10 miles from the nearest town. Um, it's uh, closest uh, A road is very difficult to travel along by foot. It's a site that's really not suitable for 1700 people to move into in a village of 700. So we have uh, real concerns and the community are very concerned about um, community safety. They're fearful about what it could mean for, for them and for the services that they rely on. Uh, so that's why we've been working with the community, with MPs and other stakeholders uh, to com to uh, suggest to the Home Office this is not a suitable site. Um, you mentioned su success. We've been going through a legal process with the Home Office, um, against the Home Office through the High Court. We've had some success in that the High Court in July agreed that we would have permission to pursue our claim for a judicial review uh, on the site on a number of grounds, including the approach the Home Office has taken through emergency permitted development powers, and also some technical issues around the environmental impact assessment and the equality impact assessment. And so there's a range of factors which we feel uh, are important that the Home Office hasn't taken into account adequately in, in developing this site. When you say local services and you're concerned about the pressure on local services, the pictures that we see of the centres of the barge, they look fairly self-contained. They look like they have, for example, medical services within the sites. What local services are you particularly concerned about? So that's true that the Home Office is intending for these sites which are non-contained but to be as, as self-contained as possible in terms of the provision of activities and facilities on the site. Um, but the healthcare provision will only be some fairly basic uh, primary health care and some dentistry. Um, there will be activities for people to, to uh, it, it get into on site and there'll be other facilities available, sporting activities. But the, the Home Office is also through their provider Clear Springs providing shuttle buses to go into local towns. Uh, and that's something which will be available to 
uh, any asylum seekers who are resident on site uh, after they've been through the initial health screenings. Uh, and that will uh, inevitably um, have some impact on local services. We don't know yet what the full extent of that will be. We've only got on the site at the moment 42 uh, young men uh, and the site, as I said, will accommodate 1,700. So uh, we're expecting that by the autumn, when the sites are, are full of capacity, we'll have a better understanding of some of those impacts. How long have they been there? Uh, just for, uh, I think, uh, two or three weeks, uh, we had initial uh, 46 arrive on site and two or three have moved off the site since then. Uh, so there's 42 at the moment and the Home Office is looking at the next group of 50 to be arriving sometime quite soon. OK, Sarah now. Um, Sarah, you're one of the lead campaigners or the lead campaigner of Save Our Scampton. Just talk us through um, what you've been campaigning for and what you have managed to achieve thus far. Well, uh, primarily, um, Scampton, when it closed or ceased being an RAF base, um, West Lindsay District Council had a deal with Scampton Holdings Limited for a £300 million regeneration project. Now, that would preserve the history and the heritage of Scampton and bring you know, money. It's not just a 300 investment. It's going to bring money in from tourism and that's going to spread out across the county. So that that primarily is what we're trying to save at the moment. Okay, and where are you thus far? I mean, why do you not want it used as an asylum centre? Well, because we'll lose a £300 million regeneration deal, which Lincolnshire is, is desperate for. Okay, okay, we're running out of time. Um, Susan, I want to go back to you and ask you. You said that if these people are all... Um, from different cultures, they're all from different communities, they all speak different languages. We don't know where they're from, but some of the people who have crossed the channel come from Sudan, right? There's a war going on in Sudan, a civil war, devastating civil war going on. So we could assume that possibly some came from Sudan. If there were 15 and up to 500 people who are coming onto that barge, who are coming from Ukraine and the situation in Ukraine, would you have the same concerns? Would you have exactly the same course of action? And would the community in Portland react the same, do you think? Well, I know that our community in Portland have reacted very kindly to Ukrainian families. I don't think the issue is exactly where they come from, but the fact they are 500 single men. That is a lot of people in this area, which has a high level of poverty. Uh, by the way, we pay more uh, rates than uh, Westminster. And I am ashamed that I didn't know just how poorly our area had been treated. So I think it's the fact that nobody is using common sense. 500 single men are going to be problematic introduced to a small area. And I'm quite shocked uh, about Wes Weathersfield as well. I'm sorry, I, I would like to spend time talking to your other guests because it is quite shocking around the whole country. RAF Scampton as well, I know. We have to look at this now. We have to say to the government, come on. Let's have some common sense here. You cannot keep doing this. There is no, there just, there just doesn't seem to be a, a reason to be doing it. What is it? Money. Money and power. The money is coming down Can right I, from I'm just going to jump in there. I'm just going to jump in there, um, Susan, and ask you this. As a member of the international community, the United Kingdom, do you feel that we have a responsibility if people are fleeing conflict, if they're fleeing for their lives? Do we have a responsibility to help them, to welcome them to our shores? If they are fleeing conflict, yes, indeed. I would say that's fine, but we do not know. We are accepting everyone, everyone from everywhere. And why are we not assessing them at source? There shouldn't be this stage where we're popping them in cupboards, whether it's in hotels or a barge, until we can get round to them. Why are we not assessing? Why are we not employing more caseworkers and get on with the productivity of helping these people if they need help, and if not, help them to go back to wherever they wish to go back to. We don't have the resources. And our little island doesn't even have enough doctors for us. So when we're talking about having a 24-hour medical service on the barge, this is causing conflict. So are the government aware they're doing this? Or are they just totally insensitive to the needs of the everyday person in the street? I'm really very, very concerned about the lack of sensitivity here, the lack of care, the duty of care to local communities, 
Yes, then let them decide. Well, we will take in X amount of families. We will do this. Mm. I'm going to have to jump in. I'm so sorry, Susan. I'm going to have to jump in. Um, I just want to thank you all so much for coming on. We appreciate your time. Uh, Dr. Susan Phoenix, Sarah Carter and Dan Gascoigne, thank you so much all. Now, the government says housing asylum seekers on that barge will save money compared to putting them in hotels while it works through the backlog of asylum claims. Joining me now is Sanja Kiam, who grew up in Afghanistan, then lived as a refugee for years, first in Pakistan and then Iran, before moving to the UK. Sanja, thank you so much for talking to us. Um, you, so you came here as a student, didn't you? You didn't come here, you didn't walk here, you didn't come over the channel, you came here as a student. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yes, I came to the UK um, as a student. I went to Glasgow University uh, to study for my master's. I returned back to Afghanistan after finishing my studies um, because I wanted to contribute to the, to the future of Afghanistan. Um, I stayed in Afghanistan for uh, two, three years, uh, but the situation was as such that I, I saw the signs that it wasn't going to be a prosperous future. And I left Afghanistan in 2011 uh, and came uh, and lived in Brighton. Um, I came to Brighton uh, to start a business. I got a visa and I've been living in Brighton since 2011. The rhetoric around asylum seekers and where they're housed and what happens to them is so heated. How do you feel as someone who, who came here and claimed asylum, someone whose first language is not English, someone who is a male of a certain age, when you feel, hear this rhetoric, what do you feel about it? What does it make you feel? Well, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, they, it brings up a lot of emotions. And, um, I, I can understand that um, the local community is concerned. I actually met somebody this weekend uh, from Portland who, who, who were very concerned about the situation. Um, at the same time, um, you know, there is, there, is, there is the need for empathy and understanding. And uh, people... people the, 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 Many of these people, life is extremely difficult in their home countries. Um, I lived in a country where I was dispossessed and displaced, and I lived in Iran and Pakistan for years as a refugee, where the situation was very difficult. And most of these men have had a terrible life. They have been traumatized, and they need some support and empathy. And, 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 and the concern that's around their situation does not help them settle in and um, find a new home in the UK. It, it's, it's an extremely complex situation. I have family who have escaped the Taliban. They were living in Afghanistan. My parents and two brothers were living in Afghanistan. The Taliban came in. My two younger brothers were going to university. The Taliban came in. They had to flee, go and live in Pakistan, where they're hiding from the police. There's, they, they, you know, thousands of Afghans have been sent back to the Taliban in Afghanistan by the Pakistani authorities, and they find that situation very difficult. But there is no way to get them here. So it's dealing every day trying to help them in a place where they are very unsafe. Sanja, you've, you've lived here for so many years. You know what life is like here. It's tough for a lot of people. I was just speaking there to um, Dr. Susan Phoenix, who said that in Portland, some people can't even see a doctor. And that's the case for a lot of people. You know, seven and a half million people are on the NHS waiting list. So you know what life is like here. What do you say to people who, who look at migrants coming in, asylum seekers, illegal migrants, who think, hang on, we can't even deal with the people that we do have. Why are we letting other people in? Yes, I know, of course. I mean, it's... Uh, public services are really stretched. And the reason for that is not because 
of migrants or refugees. The reason is underinvestment, mismanagement, and a lack of attention and good policy and strategy. And that's the failure of the government. Um, what, at the same time, we have a responsibility, a legal responsibility and a moral responsibility to help people who are escaping persecution. And, 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 and that is a different conversation. I think mixing the two conversations about management of the national resources with, the, with our responsibility for asylum, we're already setting up ourselves for a conversation where we blame a group of people for otherwise what's a government failure. Okay. Sanja, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for talking to us. Thanks for having me. You're watching Sky News tonight. Coming up tonight, we're going to discuss why so many crossing the channel in the hope of gaining asylum. The press preview, a first look at the front pages as they arrive. There's a feeling amongst some commentators that it's not the most respectful timing. I think there's a word for it, fake news. I mean, it's wah, wah, wah from Paris. Delving deeper into the stories with different perspectives on tomorrow's headlines. We really haven't seen the government getting round the table and negotiating. There are no easy answers to those questions. Join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the TAO Media family. Please like and share TAO Media. We love you all. Please support TAO Media Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.